Everybody say it. I welcome everyone to our leadership development session tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that the word of God will touch every life, transform every life, and enrich our ministries in Jesus' name. You will not labor in vain. You will not preach in vain. You will not serve in vain in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your love, and your mercy. We thank you for calling us into the ministry. Thank you, Lord, for the great responsibilities you place in our hands. And we pray, Lord, every one of us without exception will make a success out of what you've given us to do in Jesus' name. Whatever will hinder us internally, personally, habitually. We pray, Lord, you cut off from every life in Jesus' name. Make your people progressive in your work, profitable to the kingdom. And we pray, Lord, as we are touching other lives and we are bringing them closer and closer to you, we ourselves will be much more close to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can see them. We're coming to Numbers chapter 20, and we're reading from verse 10. Numbers chapter 20, we're reading from verse 10. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch water? Out of the of this rock for you. Look at verse eleven. In verse eleven, and Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Look at verse twelve. In verse twelve. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. As we look at those verses, we'll see very clearly that the temper of Moses, the anger of Moses, and the contrary action to the word of the Lord caused him entering into the land of Canaan. He was angry. Look at um, Psalm 106. We're reading from verse... Uh, sorry, look at Proverbs chapter 16, reading from verse 32. In uh, Proverbs 16, verse 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. You know, the might we have, physical, spiritual, if we don't have control over our temper, over our feeling, over the stirring that may be coming up in our heart, all that might is not as important as we thought. He that is slow to anger, defy the anger. Something has happened and you feel bad about it. Emotion is rising up. Don't say anything. Be slow to anger. If I get angry, if I react in anger, what will the consequence be? And he that ruleth a spirit, then he that taketh a city will rule over our spirit, will rule over our mind, will rule over the thoughts that are coming out from our heart. In Proverbs chapter 25, 
reading from verse 28, 25, 28, he that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls so that the enemy um, on the other side can now come in the gates are broken down the walls are broken up because he does not have control he does not have authority he does not have rule over his own spirit his own temper and so we're looking at the message tonight deliverance and dominion over anger in life and in ministry in ministry as we minister to the people of God as uh, we help the church and we preach the word of God and we tend the church like a shepherd now the many the members of the church are not at the same level some our own believers, they come to the church, they make this their church. Some are backsliders, they make this their church. Some, they have some habits that, you know, it's um, peculiar to them, and they always go in this direction. Other people are gentle and nice, but the point is, not all the members of the church will act the same way. And sometimes we'll be wondering, why, why? why don't ask why that's why you are there to help them and to make them the people they ought to be now Moses should have known he knew the people now from the time he led them out of Egypt they have been murmuring and grumbling and complaining and chiding and everything so it shouldn't be a new thing to Moses and Moses should have known this is how these people are and shouldn't have allowed the character of the people, the rebellion of the people, and the chiding of the people to push him to do or say anything. Deliverance and dominion over anger in ministry and then in life, in a personal life, husband and wife, wife and husband, parents and children, and in-laws and everybody. By the time you live together for a few months, you already know the character of your spouse. You already know the weaknesses of your spouse. So getting angry in life is not a good thing. It's not necessary. You get to an office, you are working in an office, you know the character, you know the behavior, you know the tendencies of the people you are working with in the office who are living in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood, you know, you know how people act and you know what normally happens. And if you know that, you study that, and then you make sure that all those things in life that will infuriate, all the things in life that will provoke, all the things in life that will make you step over and do things and say things you shouldn't do, you shouldn't stay, we should overcome them. So, in life, in ministry, we have deliverance from anger and we have dominion over anger. We're looking at three things in the message. Number one, the serious consequence of the manifested anger of Moses, he manifested anger, and that manifestation had serious consequence upon his life, upon his calling, upon his desires, upon the vision. I'm going to the land of Canaan, I'm going to the uh, promised land. What happened there affected everything on that side. Number two, the solemn consideration of meaningless anger in ministry meaningless anger in ministry a minister is a messenger and is sent by god to go and deliver something the good news the gospel unto the people of god you're just a messenger it's like when um, you know a rider is supposed to go and deliver meal to a particular house 
He doesn't have anything to do with the mail. He doesn't have anything to do with the people. There's no personal offense. When you get there, you deliver. If the people open the mail, that's that's a decision. If they don't open the mail, that, that they, if they react one way or the other to that mail, to that message, that's a decision. It's not your message, it's not your mail, your delivery servant. And so we ministers should understand you come to the congregation, there's nothing personal. The Lord has given you the message and you deliver to the people. What they do with the message, how they respond to the message, how they react after having the message that's between them and God. Don't take anything personal. That's what we get into trouble. It's not your message and you deliver it and the people act here and there like that. Then we feel, are they doing that to me? They are not doing that to you. You didn't have the message. They're doing that to God. Now, Moses should have understood. God said, take the rock and go to the rock and speak to the rock and God will bring water. And that's all he was to do. As to the rebellion of the people, the contradiction of the people, the lifestyle of the people, that shouldn't have been something that will get Moses on edge because they were doing that to God. We're looking at the solemn consideration of meaningless anger in ministry. Number three, the steadfast concourse of mortified anger in mastery. The, the conqueror, the one that looks at anger and he mortifies that. And he kills that anger. And he destroys that anger. And he becomes totally free from the anger that gets other people into trouble. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the serious consequence of the manifested anger of Moses. We've read the passage already. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the cause and the cost of Moses' anger. Number two, the coarseness, the coarseness. Some people call it coarseness, maybe, but the coarseness and the curse in ministerial anger. Ministerial anger. You stand on the pulpit, that's a secret calling. You stand on the pulpit, that's a secret position. And that is not the place to bring in, you know, the, the anger, the busting out and all those things. That thing can bring a curse on the minister who has ministerial, demonstrates ministerial anger. Number three, the consequence and the condemnation of messengers' anger. The messengers who are supposed to deliver the good from heaven, and then he gets out of himself and begins to react as if the people were his slaves, they were his servants, as if the people were even beasts or animals, and he treats them anyhow. Look at number one. Number one is the cause and the cost of Moses and guys, Psalm 106, what do you mean from verse 32? Psalm 106, verse 32, they angered him also at the waters of strife, so that it went ill with Moses for their sakes. They angered God and they angered Moses. And then in verse 33, we're told, because they provoked his spirit. They provoked a spirit. Your spirit is inside you. If an outsider, outside your entity, outside your body, can get in and provoke your spirit, 
you are not watchful. If an outsider can still stir up your spirit by the way they look, by the way they stand, by the things they say, by the way they act, and by the way they react, you are not in control. And if there's any part of our lives that is so very important, we should keep under our own control. If there is any part of us we should keep in check under our own control is our spirit. But if you open the door, let Satan control your spirit. Let society control your spirit. Let people in their character, in their behavior, let them control your spirit to say the least we are not wise. So they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly with his leaves. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 21. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 21. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes because of what you did. Is because of how you reacted, Moses. Not because of what the people did. Anybody can do anything. Any friend, any foe can do anything. Any familiar person that has studied you and has known this is the way you always act. Anybody can do anything. And when you when you step into that trap, it means that you yourself you're predictable. If it happens like this, that's the way you will act. If it happens like this, that's the way you will act. Anybody who can predict your action, can predict your reaction, it can determine your destiny. It can determine where you get to in life. It can determine what you do. It can determine your achievement. It can put a blockage in the way. If they can predict that this is how you like, but if you take them by surprise that the children of Israel have started again, and then you go before the Lord and fall upon your faces like uh, upon your face like uh, Moses and Aaron did, if he had continued like that and you couldn't predict his action. Uh, you know, if you look at Moses, he was coming back from the mountain and he saw that they had um, gone away into idolatry and he had tables of stones and com containing the commandment of He dropped it in anger. And then, you know, when you look at a person like that, they suppose you get angry. And Pharaoh said, you will not see my face again. And Moses got angry. I will not see your face again. And he went out in great anger. Check it, check it. That thing, if you always react like that, and the people can predict that is how you will always react, there is danger. And so he said, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not go over Jordan and that I should not go in unto that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. No more giveth us for an inheritance. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, but I must die in this land. Moses, can we blame anybody? No. Can we blame the Israelites? No. If you had kind of separated yourself from their action. You separate yourself from their attitude. That would not have happened. So the fault is, the, is in the court of the person who is manifesting anger, anger, anger. I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess that good land. Can we think a little together? The people had no water. They grumbled. Moses struck the rock. The people got water. They got advantage of the whole thing. Not only that, the people, 
they're going to get to the land. Moses labored more than everybody else. The people that just had an easy ride and the people that just did whatever they wanted to do, the younger people generation, but they were all the same, they got to the land and Moses himself did not get to the land. Why don't you think, think ahead and say, these people, if you get angry and on the pulpit, in the ministry with the people of God. They're too slow. They don't understand. If you are not as slow as them, is the gift of God. If you have conviction, is the gift of God. If you are righteous, is the gift of God. If they don't have what you have, if they're not as committed as consecrated, well, God has favored you that you have what they don't have. Anger doesn't coming now they're going to get to the good land and the man who is so angry with them he will not go over this Jordan look at um, look at um, De Deuteronomy chapter 1 I'm reading from verse 37 in verse 37 here it says also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and let's say uh, what do you want the Lord to be angry with you for for somebody's sake, for somebody who is slow. You know, people have a different, uh, different in the physical, they have different IQ, intelligence quotient. quotient. They have a different, um, you know, different situations in their body. For example, there are people that have autism. And the people that have autism, they don't act like, you know, the rest of us, like we act. They don't understand what to understand. And they're not in control of members of their body. And they are, in a way, they are demented. They do not reason like we reason. Now, that's who he is. And except a miracle takes place, he will be behaving like that. Do you know there are people that have spiritual autism? that they have that deficiency and except a miracle takes place they'll continue to act to that kind of spiritual autism so are you going to be angry even if you get angry at them that autism is there that challenge is there that's the way they always will behave so you don't allow uh, people that have different different uh, you know uh, kind of deficiencies in their physical life in their mental life in their moral life in their spiritual life to hinder you also the lord was angry with me for your sake saying thou also shall not go in hither. Let's look at number two here. Number two is the coarseness and the curse in ministerial anger. We're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're looking at verse 5 and David's anger was greatly Kindle. Here is, uh, you know, Nathan the prophet came to David and he told him a story. There's somebody in your kingdom. He didn't know it was him. And that person did this and did this and did that. By the time Nathan, uh, you know, finished uh, telling the story, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he was now going to pass judgment. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. Why don't we, you know, slow down a little bit and think through when we hear a message, when we hear a parable, when we hear a proclamation, when we hear a declaration, when, when you think it's another person, your heart on that other person. When you think it's another person, you're harsh against that person. We're normally more lenient on ourselves. If you are the one that did that, how will you react? How would you want other people to react to you? You see, that's the problem of anger. When something happens and you think that that fellow is doing that, he shouldn't have done that. 
and you're not thinking about yourself what have you done in the past you shouldn't have done what are you doing at present you are not even conscious of because you are not looking at the mirror and uh, you know you are not conscious of what's happening and so david was not conscious of what had happened and david's anger was greatly kindled look at verse 6 in verse 6 and he shall he shall restore the lamb fourfold, he will die. Not only that he will die, he will restore the uh, lamb fourfold because he did this sin and because he had no pity. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, and Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. Thou art the man now let's come back to moses this is how these people are reacting and responding moses what do you think but for the grace of god you'll be like them but for the grace of god you'll act like them but for the impact of the lord in your life you'll be like them and so instead of getting angry you think if i didn't have the grace of god if i had not gone to the mountain top if the lord had not favored me to speak to me directly i would just be like them if i were like that how would i want the leader to respond and to relate to me if i was as prayerless as they were if i had not gone into inner sanctuary as i have gone if i'm just like them i'll be acting like that when you bring it back to yourself it will calm you down it will pull you down and so he said nathan said unto david thou art the man Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And think about the judgment that David brought on the man. He will die. He will restore fourfold. And God did it pay him back according to his judgment. As God has been merciful unto you, why are you not merciful? unto others anytime we get angry at anybody we're not acting in mercy we're not acting in love we want to get a pound of flesh from him we want to you know get everything we can get out of him he must suffer for this and if god were to bring it back to you thou art the man thou art the woman where Will you be? We're looking at uh, Numbers chapter 22. In Numbers chapter 22, we're looking at verse 27. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled. And he smote the ass with a staff. Balaam's anger was kindled. Actually, the ass saw the angel and saw the sword in the hand of the angel wanting to kill Balaam. And in protecting Balaam, in avoiding that angel of the sword, then uh, the ass swerved and went aside. The ass was doing something good, but Balaam did not understand. How many times do people do good to us, but we don't understand? The goodness they're trying to do to us does not come in the way, in the usual way, in the expected way. And so anything that is new, we've never seen it like that before. This as has not behaved like that before, we misinterpret. We misinterpret the actions of people quite 
a lot. People have their own challenges. They're coming from home. They've come to the church and they have what they're thinking about. They have the burden that they're carrying and they're looking to the future. This may happen, that may happen. And because of that, they forget themselves and they do things and they might even be doing things to help us. And they're praying for us. They're providing for us. They're doing But we get angry because we misunderstand their action. You always misunderstand people. You can't know the reason why people do everything they do. Your own interpretation of what they have done will set you on edge and bring anger. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, and the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? Look at verse 29. Verse 29, and Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would, I would, uh, the, I would there, the, I would there what? A sword in my hand, and for now would I kill thee. Yet the man was still angry. What are you angry at? As you look at your life, the direction you are going, and the Lord wanted to prevent unnecessary death, spiritual death, premature death, eternal death, He allowed the ass to do what He did for your protection, for your preservation, and you are angry. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, it says, and they are said unto Balaam, am not I than us. Now, look at this. The ass was speaking with the voice, the tongue, the language of Balaam. It didn't even shock him. He didn't even think of that. We overlook great miracles when we are angry. We're only looking at this is what we do actually. Uh, anger is temporary madness. We're mad. And because we're mad, we're not using our intelligence. We're not using our brain. We're not thinking at all. We're only in that madness. We get out of ourselves. Like, you know, like Balaam. Anytime you, you know, you have the tendency to allow anger, understand, hey, madness is coming. And the madness will shut up your brain. And the madness will shut up everything you could have thought about. I'm not I than us upon which thou hast ridden uh, ever since I was thine. I was thine unto this day was I ever want to do so unto thee. And he said, nay, the ass was so intelligent, temporarily, a miracle happened. If a miracle can happen to an ass, a miracle will happen to me. And the ass did not get angry. The ass only asked, Ah, master, why are you striking me? All these days, I've been carrying you about. Did I do like this? The ass did not get angry. How would an ass be in control of his temper, of his animal nature, more than the man who was supposed to be a prophet? Always think about that. In verse 31, in verse 31, then the Lord opened the eyes, the eyes of Balaam. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and he saw drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell on the face. Now that he saw the angel, everything changed. Our temper will change when we see what we ought to see. Our emotion will change when we see the revelation 
that came from heaven. We act like this and like that. We are boisterous, we are angry, we are out of our minds because we lack revelation. When the Lord reveals to us, look at this, look at this, that we never saw before, it will calm us down. Verse 32. In verse 32, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore, as thou smitten thine ass, these three times, behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. Verse 33, in verse 33, and the ass saw me and turned from me these three times, unless she had turned from me, surely now also. I had slain thee and saved her alive. Pray to the Lord that the Lord every time will make you to see what you are not seeing, that others are seeing. And when you see, your emotion will not be rising and rising and anger will not be there. We're well, looking at Second Chronicles chapter 25. In 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 7, But there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to which with all the children of Ephraim. Verse 8. In verse 8, But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God has power to help and to cast down. Verse 9. In verse 9, and Isaiah said unto the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred? talents which I have given to the army of Israel. And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than these. Look at the next but there verse 10. Then Amaziah, Amaziah uh, separated them to which the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again, wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. Uh, the story is this, that Amaziah was going to battle, and he was of Judah. And there were, you know, all these uh, powerful, mighty army in Israel. And he got them to go along with him and he paid them a large sum of money. And the man of God came to Amazon and said, Don't allow them to go with you because the Lord is not for them. I paid them a large amount of money. What am I going to do? Well, they are not paying you back, but don't worry about that. The Lord is able to give you much more. And so Amaziah uh, went to the people and said, uh, please, you will not go. He separated them. It wasn't his fault. It's what God said. It was not acting in any way contrary to them. It's because he heard the word of the Lord. And the man of God said, if they go with you, you will fall. But God says, separate them, he will help you. And the people got angry. Always think. When something happens, you are given an opportunity before, and something happens that they say, please, you will not go with us now. Don't get angry. Why? He must have discovered something. He must have seen something. God must have spoken to him. If we understand that whatever we do in life, whatever we get to in life, God is the one planning everything, monitoring everything. And if he closes this door at this time, don't get angry. Go back to God and say, God, why? 
has this happened? Why has this happened? And look at uh, the next verse there in verse uh, 11. In verse 11, then we're told, verse 11, it says, And Amaziah strengthened himself and let forth his people and went to the valley of salt and smote of the children of Seir. 10,000 verse uh, we're looking at uh, verse 12 in verse 12 it says and uh, other 10,000 let alive did the children of Judah carry away captive and brought them into the top of the rock and cast them down from the top of the rock and they all were broken to pieces. The point is, he had the victory without the army that is sent back. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, and the soldiers of the army, which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell on the cities of Judah. And from Samaria, even unto, unto Beth Haran, and smote 3,000 of them, and took much spoil. Anger punishes innocent people for what another person had done. All those people, all those cities, they went and they ravaged them, destroyed them. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't know what Amaziah did. They were not party to what Amaziah did. And yet these people in their great anger, they went and they did that. Now, when people are angry, they don't see, they don't see innocent people. They don't see people that have not done anything wrong. They punish the wrong set of people because of what another person had done. Let's be very careful as we go through life that we're reasonable, as we go through life that we're righteous, as we go through life that we don't cause any problem for innocent people because of what another person had done. Let's look at number three now. Number three, we're looking at the consequence and condemnation of messengers anger we're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 23 Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 23 it says and I besought the Lord at that time saying 24 in 24 O Lord God thou has begun to show thy uh, to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand for what for what God is there in heaven and in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy mind. Verse 25. In verse 25, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan that good goodly mountain and lebanon verse 26 in verse 26 but the lord was wrath was angry with me for your sakes and would not hear me can you imagine this moses that prayed for a whole nation count them to be your people don't disinherit them god answered can you imagine God told him, I will make of you a great nation. He said, no, accept these people as your people. And God answered, but on this particular matter that the Lord said he will not hear him. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter that's how serious it is you see it might be a momentary temporary anger but that thing might carry a long-standing repercussion ecclesiastes chapter 7 
We're reading from verse 9. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. When you are hasty, you are not thinking. When you are hasty, you are not analyzing the situation. When you are hasty, you don't give yourself time to meditate and to think through and to find out why, what, how. If I go this direction, what's the result? Now, anybody going to analyze like that will take time. But when you are hasty, you don't give time to thinking for anger, restless in the bosom of fools. Anger, restless, abideth in the bosom of fools. Look at chapter 8, verse 9. Chapter 8, verse 9. In chapter 8, verse 9, all these have I seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. Look at this now. There is a time wherein one man rules over another to his own hurt. There is a time when a man he wants to be in authority. He wants to be in control. Not in control of himself. Not in control of his temper. In control of other people. And he does that to his own heart. Moses wanted the people to toe the line. You shouldn't be rebels. And you shouldn't be acting like this. I am your leader. Come on. Do it this way. Don't murmur anymore. And when they didn't respond the way he expected, he got angry. And their anger was condemned. There is a time wherein one man rules over another to his own heart. You know, sometimes we as leaders, we forget that we too were going to heaven. And we forget that we shall follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We carry authority too much in our head. We carry the control of people much in our heads. And the control we want to have over the people, if they're not responding the way we want them to respond, then we go astray and we hurt ourselves we stop our journey we have we manifest bad temper and we're trying to rule over other people and understand nobody not everybody will accept that kind of control and that rule they say mind your business i have my life to live i didn't get converted because of you i didn't know you when i was born again now i had the word of god i'm in the kingdom i know the word i will direct my life Life, but we'll say, no, you're not direct your life. I will direct you. I will control you. If you don't accept my rulership over you, I will get angry. Get angry and then you lose a lot. There is a time wherein one man rules over another to his own heart. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, we're looking at the solemn consideration of meaningless anger in ministry. Meaningless anger in ministry. Anger we cannot put any value to. Doesn't have any advantage. Doesn't have any meaning. Meaningless anger in ministry. Let's look at three things here. Number one, number one, the inconsiderate anger of thankless ministers. Number two, the impetuous anger of thoughtless ministers. Number three, the interminable anguish of timeless mockers. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the inconsiderate anger of thankless ministers. In Jonah chapter four, we're reading from verse one. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. 
what displeased him, God had spared the Ninevites. He had said, Ye forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And those people from the king to all the cabinets and to all the people of Nineveh, and even the bees, they did they, they fast. They were not going to eat or drink anything and the lord saw that those people of nineveh from top to the bottom from the highest to the lowest that they repented and he turned away the judgment and he had mercy on them jonah was thankless he too had gone astray he had been in the in the ship and it was a great storm what shall we do unto thee? And they threw him, according to his own word, request, they threw him into the sea. And the whale swallowed him up. And he prayed and he said, I will look into, I will look in the direction of the temple of the Lord. He said, I forsook the right way and I forsook the way of my salvation. And the Lord saw that and had mercy on him. And the whale dropped him at the shore. And the, a new chance came that he would rise up and go and talk to Nineveh. And he forgot the mercy that God has shown unto him. Thankless of the mercy. If we remember, since we became born again, some foolish things were did and God forgave. Some unscriptural things were said and God forgave. Some outright sin we even committed since we became born again and God forgave. And now we are standing and we now happen to be a minister. We now happen to be a teacher of the word and somebody does similar thing that we ourselves remember that year you remember that time we did that thing and god forgave another person now under our leadership by grace by grace not by right jonah shouldn't have been called back to come to nineveh it was not by right, it was by grace. And now God forgave the Ninevites. And the man got angry. When we get angry like that, we're thoughtless. We're thankless. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tashis. He was even glorifying his backsliding. I had a reason for going to Tashis. And now this is what I was thinking of. He was bragging about his deviation about his going astray do you do that while you're looking at others and you're not thinking of what mercy the lord had shown you you just become a thankless thoughtless minister and now you are even bragging about what happened in the past and it says for i knew that thou art a gracious god and merciful slow to your anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says therefore now O lord take i beseech thee my life from me jonah when you are in the whale's belly have you forgotten you prayed earnestly so you will not die in the whale's belly and god answered your prayer the prayer the life you preserved and the death you avoided at that time you are now saying take my life when people are angry at something they forget what happens after death i want to die I want to, they are angry you know uh, things are not going the way they expected 
and they are not getting what they think they want to and things are not going their way the action of God to the Ninevites didn't go the way of Jonah so I want to die if you die like that where will you spend eternity they are thankless and they are thoughtless of the kind of prayer they are praying and then it says for it is better for me to die than to live look at verse 4 in verse 4 then said the Lord dost thou do well to be angry Jonah think do you do well to be angry Jonah think of the mercy I had upon you and think of who you are talking to and think of the almightiness of God and you just a little man here that received the mercy of God and you're talking to God like this Jonah do you do well to be angry look at verse 9 in verse 9 and God said to Jonah dost thou Doest thou well to be angry for the God? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. You see, uh, we need to be very thoughtful. The way we feel in our heart, the heat we feel in our heart, the emotion that we feel in our heart, and slow down and think. And when you, are, when you think, then thank the Lord for what he has done for you. And no anger will remain. Look at John chapter 7, reading from verse 23. John 7, verse 23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every which whole on a Sabbath day? Think of the body I took away from his family. This man that had been impotent 30, 38 years. Think of the joy I brought to his life. Think of the goodness that I brought from heaven. And I've not done only to this man, to your relatives, to the people who are sick. And you are angry because I did that on the Sabbath day. Are you right to be angry? Because, because I made a man every which whole on the sabbath day verse 24 in verse 24 judge not according to appearance many times uh, you know something appears to be like this and we judge we judge we judge we're too hasty we're too fast to make a conclusion and then that leads to unnecessary anger but judge righteous judgment we're looking at Luke chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 26. Luke 15, 26. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things mean. Did the elder brother of the prodigal son that came back home and the father was happy. They were married. He was coming from the field. And then he checked up, what's happening at home? Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound, that he didn't die in the far country. Look at the next verse there, verse 28, and he was angry and he was angry elder brother what are you angry about your junior the people that just came the people that just got converted the people that just came into the kingdom or the people that had just restored were so happy that the prodigal, the backslider, has now repented. And as he has repented, we're so happy, we'll say, stay here. 
do this, do this. And we give him opportunity and assignment. And then we give him free hand and free, um, free interaction with the people who are, who are here. And the man is happy. He said, this is what I've been missing. And then you are there, elder brother, elder sister. And you've been faithful. You didn't backslide. You didn't go out. You've been faithfully working for the Lord. And now the fellow that just came, all attention is on him. All attention is on her. And you get angry. You are there by grace. You remain by grace. You were serving by grace. It is not of marriage. And so, if a word be shown now to the fellow that just came back, to the fellow that just got converted, it was not like that before. Before I became a worker, I stayed seven years. Before I became a location pastor, I stayed ten years. Before I became a district pastor, I was there and there. And they interviewed me and schooled me and, you know, did everything. Before I became this, and now this fellow has come. They are lowering the standard. They are rejoicing. They are merry because, you know, this fellow just came back. Back. Be thoughtful. Don't be like, you know, the thankless uh, Jonah. Uh, the Lord has shown mercy to you, and now you are not, um, you know, showing mercy to the person that just came back and he was angry and were not going. Uh, therefore, came his father out and entreated him. We're coming to number two here. Number two is the impetuous anger of thoughtless ministers. Impetuous, impetuous anger. Just, you know, something happened and impetuous like a lion. There's a lion on this side. We just bounce at people. Slow down. Kill that lion inside. We're not made to live our lives in impetuosity. Well, the reason God has given us brain is to think before you leap, is to meditate what's going to be the result of this. Look at Daniel chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Daniel chapter 2, verse 11. And it is a rare thing that the king requires and there is none other that can show each before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not for flesh. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, for this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, can we talk, can we reason together? All the wise men, all the counselors, all the advisors, advisor on economy, advisor on, you know, uh, commercial thing, advisor on public relations, advisor on religion, advisor, all the advisor, all the special advice, kill them. The man was thoughtlessly angry. When you kill all the wise men, how do you replace them immediately? Even Daniel, even Daniel, Shechem, Peshach, and Abednego, who had to go to school in Babylon and learn all the Chaldean language and all the Chaldean science and everything, you know, kill them, destroy them. When we are angry, we we'll forget that we need all these people for our lives, for our calling for ministry, for support, for our progress, thoughtless. When you get angry, don't act. Whatever makes you angry, why don't you sit and relax and think about it? If I do this, if I do that, if I do that, and kill and destroy all the advisors, all the helpers, all the supporters, what will happen? 
You get angry at your wife. If I do this, what happens to the children? You get angry at your husband. If I do this, what happens to the children, to the home? What happens to your name? What happens to your future? Nebuchadnezzar was not thinking. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, and the decree went forth that the wise men shall be slain and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. If they had gone on like that, Daniel would not have been able to interpret the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel would not have been able to interpret the other dream that came in chapter 4. The thoughtful, any time something like that happens. Proverbs chapter 27, we're reading from verse 3. A stone is heavy and a sand weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than them both. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, wrath is cruel. Anger is outrageous. Anger is outrageous. And it does outrageous things in our lives. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, without thinking, without meditating, without thinking through, thus does this justify anger? Does this justify approaching everything and scattering everything? Does this justify the destruction of property and life? Does this justify destroying, demolishing what it took 50 years to build up? Find out. And when you think and find out, you'll be slow in your action. That you so ever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, that means empty-headed fellow, anger, anger, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, because of anger, thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Verse 23. In verse 23, therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has aught against thee. Verse 24. It says, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer the gift. Number three here. Number three is the interminable anguish, agony of teamless mockers. The people who hear the word of God, and they mock that word of God. And they continue the way they've always done. Anger continues. And now the agony that comes on them, the anguish that comes upon them. Romans chapter 2, we're reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure us up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Verse 8. In verse 8, but 
to them that are contentious, pugnacious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. There will be indignation and wrath. Verse 9, in verse 9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Getting angry, acting in anger, speaking in anger is evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 5, it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, But now you also put off all these. You mortify all these. Destroy all these. Anger, destroy it. Wrath, destroy it. Malice, destroy it. Blasphemy. Feel the communication out of your mouth. Because if you don't, let that eternal punishment for the people that remain with that anger, with that wrath, with that malice. In Revelation chapter 14, reading from verse 10, it says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented of fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. And then it says, such in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. If you receive the nature of the Antichrist and of Satan who went out in great wrath to deceive and to destroy, knowing that his time is short, having his nature, having his mark, having his attitude, having his attribute, having his anger, and living a life of anger as if Satan, that running lion, is living on the inside. Remember eternity. Where will you spend eternity? We'll come to point number three. Point number three, the steadfast conquerors of mortified anger in mastery. That you pray and you allow the power of the Lord to crush that anger, to mortify that anger, to destroy that anger, and it's completely destroyed, and you have mastery over yourself, mastery, so that you're not being pushed and pushed and pushed, that, you know, I, I was pushed to do that. Why did you allow yourself to be pushed? I was pushed to say that. Why did you allow yourself to be pushed? I was pushed to get angry. Why are you going to allow somebody out there to, to have the control valve of your mind, of your spirit, pushed and pushed? Let the Lord settle in your heart, have authority in your life that you are no more under push, push, push. I will be no more under push, push. <laughs> Say it aloud. You know, it's uh, good for you to have uh, control of what you do. 
Control of what you say. Control of, you know, where you go. And control of your action. So that at least you know you are in control, not in the, of the lives of other people, in control of your own life. In control of your own emotion. In control without anger. It tells us in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading here from verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Lawfully. Everything you do, you endeavor to do it lawfully. You preach, do it lawfully. You counsel, do it lawfully. And you want to help other people, not out of, you know, control, a kind of impetuous control. No. They have right to their own lives. They have right to live according to their conviction. Even if they are too slow for you, let, let them take a responsibility for their life. And then you want to help them. You do it as somebody who has mastered anger, as somebody who has mastered wrong, impetuous emotion. It tells us in verse 6, in verse 6, the husband man that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Look at verse 7, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. The Lord give you understanding. Understanding of your own heart. Understanding of your own habit. Understanding of your own tendencies. Understanding of the things you've been doing, how you've been doing. And, you know, people have complained. And that's how my voice is. I'm not angry. Don't say that. It has, it has to be anger. Before you, it shows on the face. It shows in the voice. It shows in the action. Consider what we what we are hearing. Consider what I say. And the Lord give me understanding in all things. We're looking at three things here. Number one. Number one is a timeless demand of freedom from man's anger. Your own anger. God demands that you are free from that. Other people's anger, fury, like Nebuchadnezzar, if you don't do this, I'll throw into the furnace of fire. Be free from the anger of anybody on earth and from the anger in your own life. Number two is thorough deliverance and freedom from malicious anger malicious anger that God makes us free. Number three is total dominion through the fullness of the Messiah's atonement. We're looking at number one, timeless demand of freedom from man's anger. In Psalm 37, look at verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath fret not thyself in any wise to do evil look at verse 9 in verse 9 for evil doers shall be cut off but those that wait upon the lord they shall inherit the earth amen in ephesians chapter 4 reading from verse 30 ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby he is sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 31, in verse 31, let all, let all, let all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, in verse 32, and be ye kind, no more anger, be ye kind, no more wrath, be ye kind, and there's no more indignation, be ye kind, there's no fuming, fury on the inside anymore, be ye kind, one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as 
God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. James chapter 1, reading from verse 19. James 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. Defied. Think first. Look first. Watch first. Meditate first on what will be the repercussion if I act like this, low to wrath. In verse 20, it says in verse 20, for the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. Look at number two. Number two, it's thorough deliverance and freedom from malicious anger. In Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6, it tells us, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Anger resides in the old man. It's the depravity that brought the anger. That's why Cain was angry, because of the depravity he was born with. And he wasn't born again, he wasn't saved, he wasn't changed, he wasn't transformed. And that anger in his depravity made him to kill his brother Abel. It is the depravity in Esau that got that anger and I will kill him. The time of my father's demise, departure, is at hand. I will deal with him. And many, many years into their history, that anger was transferred to the descendants. It's in the old man, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And henceforth, you should not serve Seen. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 18 there. In verse 18, it tells us being then made free from sin. Anger is sin. When you're free from sin, you're also free from the sin of anger. Ye became the servants of righteousness. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God ye have your fruit unto holiness holiness does not indulge in anger holiness does not indulge in angry talk angry look angry feeling angry disposition angry reaction against anybody it says now you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life amen, amen. chapter 8 we're reading from verse 2 in chapter 8 verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Verse 20. In verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, hatred and anger. They are, you know, their neighbors and they belong to each other. Various emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, they are the works of the flesh. And it goes on to say, envies and murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, no anger in love, 
joy when you are happy and you are thinking of what the Lord has done for you, what the Lord is doing and what the Lord will yet do. And then there's no chance for anger. You're not thinking about that person that you are so happy and so joyful and so glad. You cannot even think of what other people are doing. And peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. In verse 23, meekness. There's no, uh, there's no anger. And meekness when you are lowly, when you are humble, when you are meek, there is no anger and temperance against such there is no law the lord make every one of us conquerors in jesus name look at point number three there now number three is total dominion through the fullness of the messiah's atonement we come to him he has atoned for our sins. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And now, look at how we live in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. That old nature is crucified with Christ. That carnal nature is a crucified with Christ. That angry disposition is crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If Christ liveth in me, would I be given expression to anger? Will I be given expression to, you know, outbursts if Christ liveth in me? And then it says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me through that atonement that he made is giving us now a new nature. And that old nature of anger, 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 boisterous and impetuous, will not think before he says anything. All that now is crucified. He tells us in Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife. Of vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, look not every man on his own things. When people get angry, you know what? They're looking on their own thing. What I like. Look at these people. They're not doing it the way I like, the way I want. And I've told them over and over and over. This is how to do it so as to make me happy. Sir, who are you? We want to be happy too. They want to be happy to make me happy, make me glad. Forget about that and look in on things your own way, what I want. Think about what other people want and think about what God wants. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5, in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When the mind of Christ is in you, you're not, you know, be getting angry at as if you are wearing your, your emotion on your sleeves. And every little thing that is done, you're offended. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Second Peter chapter 1 reading from verse 3. It says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, whereby are given unto us 
exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through laws god is impartially giving unto everyone that divine nature it will remove the human nature the animal nature, the lion-like nature, the boisterous nature, the angry nature, the depravity, the nature of Christ coming into us will remove all that and it will give us the mind of Christ, the loneliness of Christ, the gentleness of Christ, and the meekness of Christ. He will do it for every one of us, for you, for me. And when you get back home and when you get back to your local church, people will see you have been in the presence of the Lord and the Lord has done something visible, something unforgettable in your life. He will do it tonight. I said he will do it tonight. Let's rise up now and let's talk to the Lord in prayer with the understanding that this is what God God will do. Please, brothers and sisters, spend some time and talk to the Lord in prayer. He will do what he has promised that he will do.